Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So in the earlier days of my channel, one of the things that I used to somehow end up talking about fairly often was Warhammers. Um, and one of the reasons for that was I had a Warhammer, now known as the Wallhammer, of course, because it's in my garden room, which I sometimes film in. Um, but one of the things that a lot of people don't necessarily realise about Warhammers is that they think of them as a medieval weapon and don't realise that actually they persisted in use in actual fact in some places right up until the 19th century and um, what I'm about to show you here is a uh, replica made by Fabrice Cogno, a friend of mine, it's spelled Cognot incidentally but I'll put a link below to his, uh, to his stuff but this is a replica of a 17th century style um, sometimes you know 16th 17th century style of Warhammer. Um, now I am going to be looking at Fabrice's stuff in some more depth. Um, for complicated reasons there is a bunch of his stuff currently residing at my house. As it does, you might think, you know, well, I have lots of weapons in my house. Um, this was essentially because he sent a load of stuff to uh, trade at Fight Camp and uh, the Postal Service lost it. Uh, but anyway, it, it, turned, it turned up eventually at my house. So what I'm going to do um, is show you a bunch of his wares, a bunch of the things that he makes. Uh, Fabrice is a very um, authentic replicator of medieval and renaissance and other periods uh, of arms and armour and uh, even to the degree of using uh, in some cases old um, iron, old wrought iron and uh, using very traditional methods so for example if we take something like a, a pole axe or a warhammer head the original ones very often will have an iron body with hardened steel faces so rather than most modern makers would just take a piece of carbon steel and make it in the shape required uh, heat treat it through and um, and obviously sharpen it up and make it look right Fabrice goes to not with everything he makes but with most of the things he makes he goes to the lengths of making it in a more authentic way so actually having carbon steel forge welded to an iron body um, and sometimes differentially heating uh, or hardening and tempering things um, so in a much more authentic manner. Um, now I, as I say I'm going to look in more depth and with close-up photography at some of his things so don't worry if you don't get to see all of the details of this in this video because you are going to get to see this in another video but just really to say the point of this video is that warhammers weren't just a medieval weapon um, for example in parts of Europe the warhammer was still being used by cavalry um, in the 17th century uh, famous, a famous example is that is the Polish winged hussars sometimes used them. They had various types of weapons in Central and Eastern Europe and they did still have cuirassiers. Now what is a cuirassier? Quite simply it's heavy cavalry that wears a cuirass or cuirass um, and um, someone who obviously if you're fighting other other heavy cavalry and they might have a helmet and a breastplate maybe even arm armor um, and sometimes occasionally leg armor as well you need weapons that are designed for fighting against those people so the general rule is wherever you find people still fighting in armor you find weapons specialized for fighting against armored opponents and these type of late period um, warhammers are one of those and you still get them in the 16th and 17th centuries so in a period where you know many history textbooks will give you the impression that by that point you're only really dealing with um, you know pikemen musketeers and light cavalry that's not the case you still got heavy cavalry you still got cuirasses and you still got some people using these specialized armored weapons and of course what have you got with a a warhammer or a horseman's hammer as they're sometimes known well you've got essentially an indestructible shaft that's actually it's relatively light if you're wondering how much this uh, weighs I haven't actually weighed it I should um, confess straight away but if you imagine something quite similar to a normal hammer that you might have in your work shed or your toolbox it's similar to a to a normal hammer um, it's obviously a little bit longer but in terms of mass and weight distribution it's quite similar to a hammer really um, but it's a little bit longer the shaft is made of iron so you don't have to deal with it getting um, mashed up in the way that wooden shafts would um, and uh, the 
essentially the tang goes all the way through to the pommel in this case um, and you've got a little kind of guard there the guard really rather than protecting your hand because as you, as you can see the guard itself is pretty small and folded up on uh, one side incidentally uh, but the guard aside more than protecting the hand it's not really there to protect the hand it's more to keep the the hand or the gauntlet in this in many cases kind of seated on the grip and prevent it from you know sliding up the shaft this kind of thing similar to a rondel dagger in that sense and you'll notice that the hilt is actually quite similar to a rondel dagger um, and then uh, quite simply at the other end you've got a hammer and a spike why do you need a hammer and a spike well spike is obviously very very useful for penetrating mail and um, hitting into gaps between plate and potentially in some cases even penetrating thinner plates as well for example the plates covering someone's arms if you come past quickly on a horse and give give a really hard smash with the spike there's a chance you might make a hole through one of those plates through kind of you know one millimeter one and a half millimeter steel or iron you may well make a hole through that and indeed through some helmets as well and of course you can use this against unarmoured opponents but why have a hammer as well? Well quite simply spikes, the disadvantage of spikes is they will get stuck in things and you don't always want to be getting your hammer, uh, sorry your um, your spike, your, your uh, beck or your beak stuck in things and sometimes you just want to essentially have a mace and if you want that, if you just want to smash something hard and carry on moving past it then the hammer face is more effective for that. Um, one notable thing about the hammers of the, of the kind of 16th, 17th centuries is they often have this, and if you can just see there, there's actually, it's to go on your belt or hang on uh, potentially something on a saddle, but essentially it's a, a hanging device and that makes it very, very useful. Of course, you generally speaking don't want to hang this kind of weapon that way around because then you'll have a spiky pendulum swinging around on your horse, which is not really a good thing to have. Instead, it's better to hang it that way around and have the blunt uh, handle end swinging around and not spiking you repeatedly in the hip um, so that's a, a friendlier way to wear it for you and your and your buddies just quickly um, I will show you yet another example because that's right for Brees didn't just send one he sent two now this one I'll give you a brief close-up of it is like a super duper ornate version um, and it's got first of all the thing you notice is the twisted shaft there's the Sorry, I'll try and do this to get it focused. There's the belt hook at the back, and you can hopefully start to see etching in there as well. And the entire thing, the spike, uh, and indeed the guard, and the pommel is decoratively etched. And this is uh, bling. This is this is a bling version. This is actually very slightly lighter than the other one, um, although fundamentally they're very similar weapons. You'll notice they're not particularly long. Incidentally, for armoured fighting uh, warhammers and maces, they tend not to be very long. Um, about the size of a hatchet, um, a bit longer than a than a normal hammer, um, shorter than a sword. But you don't need the reach of a sword if you're fighting an armour necessarily, um, and. And yeah, there you go. So despite the fact that they're often called horsemen's hammers, they're not long weapons. There's a perception that uh, if you're fighting on horseback, you need a longer weapon. It really, again, it always comes down to context. If you're fighting armoured on horseback against another armoured opponent, you might have a lance for long distance thing, for attacking pikemen or infantry uh, with the lance. Uh, you might have a sword, indeed. In fact, you usually would have a sword. Most people of that type would have a sword. But you might have this specifically for fighting another armoured opponent. And if you're fighting this type of armoured opponent, it might be the horse is moving relatively slowly around each other and you just trying to get really powerful blows to compromise their armour with your hammer or mace or whatever you're using. Just to finish up, so I mentioned these were used until the 19th century in certain parts of the world. Well, of course, the famous example would be India. Um, or indeed Persia, um, parts of parts of Asia essentially, uh, and the Middle East, where armour was still worn. So it comes back to the point that wherever you find armour being worn, doesn't matter whether it's the 15th century or the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, wherever you find armour being worn, you'll find anti-armour weapons being used. So these warhammers were still being used at the time of the English Civil War in some parts of Europe, 
and indeed similar kind of picks to this were being used in, in Asia, in India for example, in the 19th century. There we go, cheers folks! Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.